Coming up on West Side Stories, Grand Valley State University has a new president. We catch up with the newest member of the Laker family. And we explore how proposed changes to Title IX could alter how universities handle sexual harassment cases. Plus, with recreational marijuana now legal, could Grand Rapids become the growing capital of Michigan? All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories. I'm Preston Anikuski. And I'm Elliot Perpich. Grand Valley State University has a new president. GVSU's Board of Trustees has appointed Philomena Mantella as the university's fifth president. She'll take over for retiring president Thomas Haas in July. Reporter Linnea Martinez caught up with GVSU's new president as she met the student senate for the first time. I'm absolutely humbled and thrilled to be elected Grand Valley State University's fifth president. Philomena Mantella is currently the Vice President of Northeastern University in Boston, but in less than a year, she'll be replacing President Haas as the first female Grand Valley State University President. What drew me is I think it's really student-centered at its heart. Um, it has a strong experience. You drew me, and I mean that quite frankly, because I was interviewing you as well as you were interviewing me. Mantella sat down with members of the Student Senate to have an open discussion about what they want in their community. Students were able to ask questions and get some answers. I'm curious to know um, your prioritization about sustainability and resource management. Yeah. When Mantella begins her tenure as GVSU's fifth president, she will have some big shoes to fill. President Thomas Haas, or T. Haas as he's known, has served GVSU as president since 2006. T. Haas is popular among students and well respected. Mantella says she recognizes this and intends to make the transition between presidents as smooth as possible. We're going to make this transition as seamless as it can be for the university. Um, and he's not going anywhere, you know, which is great. I mean, the, the fact that the presidents of Grand Valley State University are still here and supporting the university is just uh, a gift. Mantella has already shown that she's ready to carry on one of T. Haas's traditions by taking selfies with students. In fact, she says she wants to focus on students and student concerns while she goes about the business of leading one of the fastest growing universities in Michigan. She wanted to assure all students that she will be actively working to maintain Grand Valley's sense of community. But I'll be really careful with the essence of the place. I want you to know that because I think it's something that we want to preserve and protect. So we want to figure out what is its essence. Mantella said that, overall, she's excited to begin working with students and has big plans to make the university shine. It's an incredible university. I think um, taken all together, it's learning experience, it's commitment from the community, it's um, outcomes, it's efficiency, all of those things. It's got to be pretty unparalleled in higher education, and we plan to make it uh, an absolute star. In Allendale, I'm Linnea Martinez. Mantella will continue working at Northeastern University until July 1st. That's when she'll officially take the reins as GVSU's new president. Outgoing President Thomas Haas is retiring from administrative office, but will still teach at GVSU. GVSU students are protesting U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos's proposed changes to Title IX. Title IX spells out how educational institutions should handle sexual harassment cases. Reporter Eli Ong filed this report from GVSU's Allendale campus. On Wednesday, January 16th, students and faculty gathered at the clock tower on GVSU's Allendale campus to protest changes to Title IX legislation proposed by U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos. The event, a silent march organized by Student Senate President Rachel Jenkin, was designed to spread awareness to the student body about a resolution Student Senate passed that condemns the proposed Title IX changes. 
earlier in the last semester, um, I drafted a resolution for Title, or I'm sorry, for Student Senate to pass, and the resolution spoke of our dissent towards the Title IX changes. Um, it was two and a half pages, and basically stating um, how some of the changes would hurt our student population. Those changes revolve around five main provisions that would impact how universities would be required to go about investigating Title IX related incidents. As a part of the proposed changes to Title IX, those accused of sexual misconduct would now have the right to cross-examine their accuser. Colleges would also only be required to investigate formal claims of on-campus sexual misconduct, as well as have the option to use a higher standard of proof during investigations. In addition, they would also be able to use informal mediation and resolution strategies when they see fit. The definition of sexual assault would also be narrowed from unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature to unwelcome conduct on the basis of sex that is so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive that it effectively denies a person equal access to the recipient's education program or activity. After the march, we caught up with some GVSU students to ask their opinions on these proposed Title IX changes. The person that is being accused, a better chance to defend themselves and provide reason and evidence to support their their own self. It hits home because it can bring flashbacks and it might not give survivors the appropriate support that is needed after such a catastrophic event. I think um, a person accused of sexual misconduct um, has the right to cross-examine the accuser. I think that can go both ways. If there's an offense that's pretty obvious that the person did it, um, I think that would be pretty, it would just add to the trauma of the victim. I don't think they're good changes. I mean, it's like being off campus, it's still kind of like being on campus. So I don't know really, I mean, as far as like, it's not like we live in houses and stuff and we're around people, we still have to deal with absolute and stuff. So it's not really like we're that free. Crystal Deal, who works as a victim's advocate at the GVSU Gail R. Davis Center for Women and Gender Equity, feels that there are some red flags when it comes to this proposed legislation as well. Um, we do have some concerns about the proposed regulations, especially in order to ensure the well-being of all our survivors. Deal says she is concerned with how universities would no longer be required to investigate off-campus sexual assaults. Due to GVSU's large off-campus student population, many students have reached out to deal with questions regarding the matter. So I've had a lot of groups reach out to me, some student orgs, individual students, who've really all expressed concern, um, are really worried about if this will kind of take away their rights as students, will it protect them as survivors? Jesse Bernal, the Vice President for Inclusion and Equity at GVSU, says that Grand Valley will still maintain the same standards when it comes to Title IX legislation, whether or not the new regulations pass. Here at Grand Valley, everyone's required to report except for a counselor, and we're going to maintain that, that uh, provision. So while they, the Department of Education is allowing a lot more flexibility and reducing some of the thresholds for requirements, uh, we're going to maintain many of the provisions that we have in place currently. In specific, GVSU will maintain its definition of sexual misconduct as well as their standards of proof, which align with standards set under the Obama administration, according to Bernal. In relation to concerns that GVSU would no longer have to investigate off-campus sexual assaults, Lorene Haran, associate editor for the Grand Valley Lanthorn, has made a discovery that may surprise you. When you map out the data, the majority of the uh, assaults that Grand Valley responded to were indeed on the campus dorms. So to me, that seems to be the biggest thing that stood out to me is the fact that this is actually a very prominent issue on campus and we're not really being alerted about it. Haran's research found that there were 15 instances during the 2018 fall semester where GVSU police investigated a claim of sexual violence. Of those 15 instances, 13 occurred on GVSU's campus. Something else Haran found alarming was how little GVPD notified students of their sexual assault investigations. I was noticing that at least once a week, a Grand Valley Police Department was responding to um, either a sexual assault, a criminal sexual conduct, or some kind of like stalking, something in the sexual violence category. And what was interesting is that out of all of these different cases that happened last semester, 
we only got two total alerts. According to a GVPD statement obtained by Haran, GVPD's policy behind reporting only two incidents is that the suspect was identified and determined not to be an imminent threat to the GVSU community in 13 of the 15 cases. Moving forward, Haran will publish her findings in the Lanthorn in hopes that her work will help GVSU improve their safety reporting system for students. From Allendale, Michigan, I'm Eli Ong. The Title IX changes are currently open for public comment. If you would like to weigh in with your thoughts, you had better hurry. The government portal is only open until Monday, January 28th. If you would like the link for public comment, please visit our YouTube channel at West Side Stories Television. A new program at Grand Valley State University is helping veterans and their families learn skills that might just help them start their own businesses. Reporter Austin Marsman has more on how this program is making a difference. Looking to spur veteran economic involvement, officials at GVSU decided to form the Michigan Veterans Entrepreneur Lab at the downtown Grand Rapids Pew campus. Trey Sumner was one of the first veterans to go through the program. I uh, served for 26 years in the Army and Army National Guard. After returning from service, Sumner knew what he wanted to do, but he didn't know if this new program would be the right fit. I, I didn't know if I was the right fit for the program, but overall, I learned so much about the nuts and bolts of what you have to do. I'm, I'm really good uh, at the boots on the ground stuff that I do. Julie Cowie is the project manager for the MVE Lab, and as she explains, it's all about giving veterans the tools they need to be successful. And it's really designed to help those people who have a startup idea or who are interested in entrepreneurship discover what they need to do to start up successfully. So, you know, several of them want to just be their own boss because they are good leaders themselves and they know how to execute a mission. Sumner took the knowledge from the classrooms of GVSU and got his idea for a mentorship program off the ground, winning him $4,000 at a pitch night last November in Grand Rapids. ACES stands for Awareness, Compassion, Equity, and Strength. And what it is is a mentorship program for young men to give them the tools, the permission, and the freedom to be able to develop and demonstrate a healthy masculinity. I believe that as men, we extract so much of what is great about being a human being from what it means to be a man. We have a very narrow definition of what is acceptable manliness, which is why with ACES, I hope to create not only to give the boys this permission, this, the tools they need, the freedom, but also to create a community. It is much easier for young men to do something that goes against what everybody else is doing if they've got a peer group to work with. So that's what I want to do is build these. In each session of ACEs, there's a group that will work together. And then I tie the groups together. So eventually, hopefully, I'm building a whole community of young men. Sumner isn't the only one that went through this program. In total, nearly 10 veterans participated, and now they have businesses ranging from a bakery in Holland to a shaving supply company. In Grand Rapids, I'm Austin Marsman. Such an inspiring story. Thank you for that, Austin. If you know a veteran who might benefit from this program, the Michigan Veterans Entrepreneur Lab will start their second cohort in February. For more information, check out gvsu.edu mve. Now that the recreational use of marijuana is legal in Michigan, the race is on to see which Michigan city will be the first to take advantage of this new growth industry. If you think that city is going to be Grand Rapids, you might be in for a long wait. But as reporter McKenna Peroso reports, the Grand Rapids City Planning Commission has finally begun accepting land use applications for marijuana distributors. So we, right now, we'll be accepting applications for transporters, secure transporters, as well as testing facilities. More than 10 years since medical marijuana was approved in Michigan, the city of Grand Rapids is finally getting the application process started. But what took so long? We've had medical marijuana legal since 2008, and we don't even have any dispensaries. We don't have any provisioning centers. We don't have any grow facilities. Lansing, Detroit, um, Ypsilanti, Ann Arbor, um, seeing medical marijuana businesses pop up. And then we would come home <laughs> and we would see nothing in Grand Rapids, the, the second largest city in the state. Grand Rapids specifically uh, is futile in terms of patients trying to get medicine. It's, it's, it's become so difficult that they have to find illegal ways to obtain medicine. 
In 2016, the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs, or LARA, was given one year to set the rules for medical marijuana facilities. The difficulty was is at the end of 17, once uh, those rules were created, we started hearing about recreational marijuana going on the ballot. And so knowing recreational was then on the horizon, we wanted to wait so we could look at everything all together in a package. There was a lot of waiting, you know, it was, well, let's, let's, let's see what happens in other cities and let's see what the state says. And I think, uh, I think there was a lot of fear, to be honest. I think we're dealing with decades of reefer madness. While the rules may be set for medical marijuana, Lara still has another year to figure out the rules for recreational. So they have until December of 2019 to make rules for recreational marijuana facilities. So no recreational marijuana facilities will be licensed until this time next year, it's likely, depending on what the rules are. Even with another year out, the zoning restrictions for marijuana facilities are already having an effect on the city's growing industry. The city spent a lot of time listening to a lot of concerns, listening to a lot of advocates, and came up with some zoning requirements, some application requirements. However, the zoning is so restricted to just a couple of, a, a few areas. And this is one of the things that we, we tried to warn the city commission is the the fewer the properties, A, the prices are going to skyrocket, right? Uh, we're seeing real estate that are in these zones go up three times in value. Prices have gone up two to three times what the value of the land might be uh, based on speculation and people wanting to go into those spaces. So we're expecting that marijuana facilities will be located a thousand feet from schools, churches, daycares, places of worship, and rehabilitation facilities and then for marijuana provisioning centers that they will be distanced 2,000 feet apart. Oftentimes what we're seeing is actually a full land transaction, whether or not that property has been approved for marijuana yet. With real estate prices skyrocketing in some areas and Lara's marijuana licensing facility fee reaching $44,000 this year, many are worried that the high cost will push out local investors. It's designed to be able to cover the cost of administering the new law and ordinances and all the paperwork and notifications that have to be done. Uh, rumor has it will go up to 66000 So um, it's not an inexpensive business venture to enter into marijuana. This is only going to make it better if, it, if it's done well, right? If it's not just for corporate, really wealthy people to get into this market. That's, that's going to be the key. You know, this is a once in a generation kind of opportunity. We want to see locals. We want to see people of color. We want to see women. We want to see people from the gay community. We want to see people from throughout the city. Letting locals get in early is really going to shape how this thing goes. So the city commission wants local ownership in the general target area, which is the center city of Grand Rapids. If somebody lives there, they get a point. Uh, if they live in the general city uh, as a whole, they get another point. If they live within Kent County, they get a point. So they're very focused on local ownership and then also local hiring uh, and the use of local vendors. And so all of those things can add up. Uh, to determine the priority order to go to the Planning Commission. Some are hopeful for the city's <laughs> new marijuana industry, while others see a long road ahead. The problem is, is that there are so few dispensaries. The state has not been very good at implementing this program. There have been three dispensaries in particular have been opening and closing on a regular basis because they open for a short time and the city comes in and closes them down. The same people who are going to handle uh, recreational marijuana, which is Lara, and to me, uh, I, I don't have any faith in them. Mm -hmm. I see just another 10 years of, of absolute absurdity. You will see construction activity. I don't know if you will see businesses open. Uh, it really depends on the amount of workload that the state has. I, I think it could change our city for, for the better, um, which is why I worked so hard on, on the proposal. I have I have huge hopes for the new leadership. We're in a new day between Prop 1 passing and between uh, those two fantastic people being at the top of, of our government. Uh, I, I couldn't be more optimistic for 2019. In Grand Rapids, I'm McKenna Pariso. The city will hold the draw to begin hearing applications for marijuana provisioning centers on April 12th. 
The drawing will be live streamed on the city's Facebook page. And now it's time for our weekly calendar segment. Let's check it out. According to an article posted in Financial Times, Americans spend on average around $1,100 a year on prescription medication. Reporter Savannah Bressman shows us how one Grand Rapids shop is trying to change that by promoting an alternative approach to medicine. It just does everything good for your body while relaxing you. That was Ricardo Shanino, owner of Cava Casa. According to some reviews found on Yelp and Google, Cava is something special. Here's what some people had to say. I was sold the minute the barista explained what this miracle plant does. It almost makes you feel like you had a nice glass of red wine without the drunk feeling. I love kava. It helped me with my anxiety and my focus. These claims seem pretty bold, so we decided to check it out. Cava Casa is located on the corner of Cherry and Diamond Avenue. It opened its doors almost two years ago. This shop offers a unique experience that Shanina claims is an alternative to addictive substances like alcohol and drugs. Shanina says Kava works so well for him, he decided to make it his life's work. This has changed my whole life around. Um, I mean, it's just so amazing. Uh, you know, these days, um, every little side effect, every little reason they're trying to give you a pill. Shanina thinks doctors are often too quick to prescribe pills. He believes a natural solution is much better. So his recommendation is for people to try kava. This tea is made from the root of a plant found in the Polynesian Islands. He claims different parts of the root can cause different effects. Okay, kava is a root uh, from the Polynesian Islands, which is grounded up and mixed with water, and that's the kava. Um, it has um, two parts of the plant, which is a uh, basil root and the lateral root. The basil root is going to give the mind effect. The lateral is going to give the body effect. Shanina claims the tea from the root can have an effect on both the mind and the body. And according to users, that effect feels a lot like being drunk without consuming any alcohol. Shanina says it gives the sense of relaxation without losing motor function. My best ones are anxiety stress, uh, muscle relaxant, um, antiviral, antibacterial, anesthetic, analgesic, probiotic, um, anti-inflammatory. Research done by the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health on the effects of kava tea supports Shanina's claims of reducing anxiety. And customers like Brianna Tabbitt would agree. I would say that it's definitely calmed me down. Um, I'm not so anxious all the time, um, and it's made me a lot more social um, and a lot more happy. I'm always laughing now. While research shows Tabbitt's claims are true, it is important to note that research also shows that too much kava can result in liver damage. The taste of kava itself is very earthy. Shanina and Tabbitt say that adding milk or sweetener helps the tea taste better. And the container for it put the kava in a strainer bag so let it soak for five to ten minutes and you just kind of squeeze it out. You could totally drink it but I'm not a big fan of the natural earthy taste so I like to add sugar and milk in there. Shanina says that for users to get the full effect of kava you need more right away so he suggests drinking the liquid fast. Users say that no matter how you choose to drink your kava, you will experience the same side effects, meaning your tongue and mouth 
will go numb. It was such a weird feeling because it completely numbs your mouth. Um, and then after that, I just felt absolutely relaxed. Cavacasa is open seven days a week, and Shanina says that no matter if you are having a bad day or are experiencing an anxiety attack, Kava is able to benefit everyone. Everybody has those ruminating thoughts, just, you know, getting through the day. Life is difficult. So this just, it just helps them get through the day more relaxed, more at peace, um, more focused. Whether Kava's your cup of tea or not, you can only find this one-of-a-kind experience right here. Reporting in Grand Rapids, I'm Savannah Brussman. And if you're interested in checking out Cava Casa, it's important to know that they do not serve anyone under 18 without parental permission. This is because of the strong effects of the tea. And that is all the time we have for this week. I'm Elliot Perpich. And I'm Preston Nikuski. We'll see you next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications, inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Thank you.